Exodus chapter 3 is where this show me your glory bit comes from. And the Bible says in verse 1 of Exodus chapter 3, And the Lord said to Moses, get going, you and your people. These people, you can say, make me sound more anointed. Um, There. (laughs) See, these people had already got out of Egypt. But, you know, God's plan wasn't wasn't just for them to stay where they were. They actually had a promise to take the promised land. You know, you can get set free of something, but God just doesn't want you to stay in that place. He wants you to take freedom to other people. And it says, get going, you and the people I brought out from the land of Egypt. Go up to the land I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, young people here today, we're not here because we're the only generation. We're here because generations before us have paved a way for us to step into. And we are a generational people. We're not just a young church. We're not just a, 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 I'm young still, middle-aged or no one's old really if you look at it everyone's young compared to God so there you go so how you view it but we stand on the shoulders of previous generations and so he said this and I told them I will give you this land everyone say I will give you this land push your neighbor and say that's speaking to you and to your descendants and I'll send an angel before you to drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Go up to this land that flows with milk and honey. But I will not travel among you. You are a stubborn and rebellious people. This is God saying, and if I did, you would surely destroy you along the way. And the Bible says, when the people heard these stern words, they went into mourning and stooped, wearing their jewelry, stopped wearing their jewelry and fine clothes. For the Lord had told told Moses, Tell them, you are stubborn and rebellious. And if I were to travel with you even a moment, I would destroy you. Remove your jewelry, your fine clothes, while I decide to do what to do with you. Pretty crazy situation. You know, so many times we have a generation that worry how they look what label they wear, what, how, how their vibe is. You know, your vibe will never change a generation. The God in you will change a generation. Now, I, I'm not against fashion and being, looking cool. I, I'm not against all this stuff, but this stuff doesn't change you. It just helps convey a message. And the Church of Jesus for, in the Western world became so reliant on being cool and relevant it lost why it was supposed to be relevant and cool. You see, when my mum was dying of cancer, my skinny jeans couldn't do anything. When she needed a breakthrough, she needed something more than some cool shoes. I'm not against cool shoes, I like cool shoes. But we can't put our dependence on how we look or how how we roll or what swag we have. We put our dependence on God and God alone because He's the one who changes generations. If you believe that, clap like you believe that. If you believe that, shout like you believe it. And it was Moses' practice to take the tent of meeting and set it up some distance from the camp. Everyone who wanted to make a request to the Lord would go to the tent of meeting. And so Moses went down to the tent of meeting and we, oh, so he goes in there. One day Moses says to the Lord, verse 12, you've been telling me, take these people to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you'll send with me. You've told me, I know you by name and I look favorably on you. What an amazing thing to hear from God. I know you by name and I look favorably upon you. You know, God knows you all by name. He knows how many hairs you have, and me, it's easier to count every day. Bald people are anointed, by the way. They shine the glory of the Lord. See, God knows you by name. He looks with you and He says, I wanna give you favour. I wanna give you blessing. I wanna pour out my presence upon you. I've done everything for you, so you gotta put your dependence upon me. 
And he says, Moses says, if it is true that you look favorably on me, then let me know your ways. Would there be a group of people here at Planet Shakers that say, God, if you look favorably on us, we're not worried about the favor. We want to know your ways. We want to know you. We just don't want to have a church service. We want to experience you personally. Let me know and understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. Remember that this nation is your own people. And the, and the Lord replied to Planet Shakers. I will personally go with you. I'll go with you, Moses. I'll go with you, Russell. I'll go with you, Sam. I'll go with you, Art. I'll, I'll go with you, Reggie. I'll, I'll go with you, Phil. I'll, I'll, I'll go with you, uh, you know, uh, Zach. I'll go with you. I'll personally go with you. I don't know about you, but that's pretty awesome. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in me and lives in you. So God says, wherever you go, I go. Wherever you step into, I step into. You think about that in the good. Wherever you go, you bring His goodness. But you think about it every time we turn from God, He's still there. He says, I'll personally go with you. Hmm. And Moses said, and, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Everyone say fine. Then Moses says, if you don't go personally with us, don't make us leave this place. For how will anyone know that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us for your, your what? Your among us sets your people and me apart. You know, in this venue, there's been bands that have had LEDs and, and had people and there was they knew songs and it was good and it was a nice experience. There, there were good speeches from this pulpit or from this stage. There were, there, there's different entertainment that's happened in this venue. But you know what sets God's people apart? It's not the lights. It's not the screens. They're just an expression of our greatness of God. We just want to give Him the best. But what sets us apart is His presence. We need His presence more than anything or any time on this earth. Recently, I, I spoke a, ser uh, a sermon at church talking about living for eternity. And I, and I said... In the last days, there'll be persecution and there'll be troubles and, and really it's Jezebel. There'll be all this stuff, Ahab, what we heard in the last session. And so at one moment, you've got all these challenging times and troubles and tribulations. You've got all this stuff happening. People will, will say things about you, vilify you. They'll do all these things to take you down, to cancel you. But the very remedy to all those things is His presence. Because when we are in His presence, that's what sets us apart. When we encounter Him and His power comes upon us, that's what sets us apart. You see, people can't cancel you unless you let them. Because God never cancelled you. He says, I chose you. I appointed you. I anointed you. The church is a church of restoration, not cancellation. The only thing Jesus canceled was Satan and sin. The rest He gave to us. For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all the other people on the earth. I've had people turn, to, turn, turn up to church. This happens a lot. And they go, when I walk through the doors, there's this peace. There's this love, there's this life. I, I never experienced it before. And then I get in to the meetings and, and people are singing and shouting and dancing. And, and it's like, wow, it's amazing. They, they see the stuff initially, but they say, it's just the presence. I, I don't know how to explain it, but the, it's so good. See, when you walk into the room, you carry Him, His presence that sets you apart. The Jezebel spirit hates that presence. The Bible says in Revelation, the church, 
that defeats the Jezebel spirit will be given the morning star. You know what the morning star is? It's the manifest presence of God. That when you don't walk under intimidation, manipulation and control, but you walk according to a kingdom full of faith and full of honour, you you carry the presence of God and that what sets you apart. You are called to be a presence carrier. Show us your glory, Lord. And the Lord replied to Moses, I have indeed do what you have asked. For I look favourably on you and I know you by name. Moses responded and he says, Then show me your glorious presence. And the Lord replied, I will make all goodness pass before you. And I'll call you, call, I will call out my name Yahweh, for I will show mercy. I will show compassion. <laughs> he encounters God, and the Bible says, and Joshua was there. But it's interesting, it says, when you go out here, the angel of the Lord is going to go and defeat the, Ca- the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the So here's an interesting thing, just quickly, I looked up some of what these represents. The Amorites represents a lover of self, fame seeking, loves to hear their name called and they speak against others. If we're gonna carry the glory of the Lord, we can't operate under an Amorite spirit that is a lover of self, fame seeking, sounds like the West to me, loves to hear their name called and they speak against others. If we're going to experience the glory of God, we can't be fame seekers, we've got to be God seekers. Another spirit, they said, you have to defeat the Canaanites and the Canaanites were one who lived for material things. If you want to experience the glory of God, you can't be consumed with material things. They're just a servant to you. They're not a master to you. I believe God wants to bless you. I believe God wants to show His love to you because He's a good God. But we don't pursue we don't pursue stuff. We pursue a Saviour. We don't pursue how we look. We pursue who He is. So if we're going to see the glory of God, you've got to overcome the Canaanites. The Hivites were a village of nomads. They were self-dependent. They kept away from everybody. If you're going to experience the glory of the Lord, you've got to get away from that self-protection and let yourself be yielded to Him. Say, God, I just want You. However it looks, I just want You. See, people go, well, I want God, but I want it. I don't want to cry and I don't want to shake and I don't want to fall and I don't want to do all that stuff because I I I just don't want people to see that. But the truth is, if I put my finger in a power socket, there is a reaction. And I might try to control it, but I can't because once I've encountered the power, the power consumes me. But I got to put my finger in to experience the power. And some of us have got to say, I've got to stop worrying what people think. I've got to stop being in this self-protection mode. But i just got to say, God, however it looks, however it sounds, however it is, I just want You come and touch me unless Your presence. The Perizzites were unprotected villages, which represents poverty and smallness. If we're going to experience the glory of the Lord, we we can't live with a poverty mindset and a small mindset. God is not a God of poverty. He's a God of blessing. He's a God of more than enough. He's a God of prosperity. He's a God that is with you in the storm. He's with you on the mountain. He's with you in the valley. But He's still there. And wherever God is, there's always blessing. When the presence of God turned up to Obed-Edom's house, Obed, servant, Edom, wilderness, a man who had served the wilderness, had the presence of God turn up to his house. And all of a sudden, everything changed. And then they took the ark. And what did Obed-Edom do? Did he sit down and create a memorial? Say, remember when God moved? 
at Planet Shakers, we are grateful for what God done in the, has done in the past, but He's got greater for the future. And so we, we, we honour the past, but our focus is on the future. You see, our, we drive in a car, you have a small mirror. It's called the rear vision mirror. You look, glance back and go, thank you. Awesome, it's all good. But you have a windscreen that shows you the future. We're not going to live in the rear vision. We're going to live in the windscreen of faith. We're going to see the promises and the blessing of God. Greater days are ahead. Greater breakthroughs are ahead. Greater things that we'd ever see. Everybody shout, greater! They have to defeat the Jebusites, which means to trample down or take what belongs to you. You gotta stop letting the enemy steal from you your joy. You gotta stop the enemy stealing from you your power and your passion. We gotta stop listening to the lies of the enemy. That's why at times I just can't get my head in social media because it's full of rubbish. My media comes from heaven. I'm socially connected to heaven. It's where the community is. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one. I'm not against social media, but the truth is I'm not gonna get my, my food out of social media. I, I'm not gonna let people trample down and take what belongs to us. The Hittites were the sons of terror they brought dread and broke, and they brought broken in pieces. So we got to stop living and, and, and stop worrying about the terror or, or, or the things that the enemy will try to do to us. You're more than a conqueror. So today, the title of my message, which I close in a minute, is called In the Room. In the Room. See, in the room, the tent of meeting, Moses got to go, but there was another guy called Joshua. He got to go in there too. My question to you is, who wants to be in the room of His glory? You see, the tenor meeting represents God's presence, God's favours, God's voice. I want to be in that room where God speaks. I want to be in that room where God moves. I want to be in that room. What is a room? A room is a place that takes my, my environment and that's how I fill my life around. In the room. In Mark chapter 5, there's another room. Jesus is on His way to Jairus' house, his daughter's sick, Jairus or however you say it. And a woman comes desperate because she doesn't care what people think. She pushes through the crowd just to touch the hem of his garment. She says, I just, I, I just gotta take my attention off the people and I gotta look for my potential. I gotta see my breakthrough. I wanna see my faith. And Jesus is on this way and he stops. He says, who touched me? It's a really... Scary question to this lady because the Bible says that in those days, anyone who was unclean could not come into the camp. And in Old Testament, anything that was unclean that touched clean made it unclean. And you could die for that. So when Jesus said, who touched me? Remember, she pushed her way through the crowd so she touched more than Him. He was asking her a question that was a very vulnerable question. Who touched me? She says, it was me. He says, good, go, your faith has made you well. And something transitions in Scripture right then. It transitions from something unclean touching something that's clean becomes unclean. Now that something unclean touches something that's clean, it becomes clean. Why? Because she didn't worry what people thought. So Jesus ends up getting to the place Uh, and it says, verse 35, and while he was still speaking, messengers arrived at Jairus', the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and they told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now, but Jesus overheard them, and he says, don't be afraid, just have faith. See, even in the Bible, there were counselors, people of little faith. And then Jesus stopped the crowd and He wouldn't let anyone go with Him except Peter, James and John, 
the brothers of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and wailing and weeping. And he went inside and he said, while this commotion and weeping, the child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed, they mocked him. But he made them all leave and he took the girl's father and mother and the three disciples into the room where he was lying. Holding her, he said to her, Talitha Koam, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around and they were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus had 12 disciples. How did only three get in? There was something about James and John and Peter that got them in the room. He loved all the disciples, but there's something that they had that, that, that got him in the room because he didn't want unbelief in the room. That's why Thomas wasn't there. I'm here to encourage you. You might be a follower of Jesus, but you don't get into that room of intimacy. You don't get into that room of faith. You don't get into the room of vulnerability in the room. Think about James, John's and John, James, John and Peter. Jesus allowed him into the room of transfiguration where Moses turns up and and Abraham turns up and Elijah turns up, lets him into the room to witness his pain. They're the only three disciples mentioned in the book of Acts. So what is the characteristics of James, John and Peter that got him into the room of this intimate relationship with Jesus? They were loyal even though they sometimes fell, they were loyal. God's looking for a generation that'll be loyal to Him, His presence and His Word and to the people of God. They had great faith, even though they stumbled at time. Peter was the one who walked on water. Even though they were challenged at time, they still believed. We need to be people who have great faith. Great faith gets you in the room. They had great desire. They just wanted to be just like John on Jesus' chest. Great faith got him in the room of intimacy. And they had a great pursuit to be close to Jesus. Let me take you to another room. There's 120 in an upper room. Thousands had followed Jesus. A crowd had thronged Him, the Bible says, and and they'd be chasing Him and and miracles were happening and He was really popular when it was all going good. But when He was on the cross, the people left in droves. And there's only a few left, but there's 120 disciples, 120 followers of Jesus that just got in the room and waited for the Holy Spirit to come. We have 6,000 registrants at this conference. Would there be 6,000 or 4,000, whoever, how many here at the moment, would just get in the room and say, God, pour out your Spirit. Get in the room, let your fire come. Get in your room, let the rain of God come. Get in the room. Because in this room, The world was changed. You're in the room today because 120 went in the room. Imagine if 4,000 people got in the room of His presence. Imagine the future that would change. It could be billions of people just like the 120 started in the room. You say, but I'm not worthy to get in the room. Yes, you are. Because Hebrews 4 says, so then... Since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. The high priest of our weaknesses understands our weaknesses for he is faced with all the same testings, yet he did not sin. So let's come boldly into the throne room of our gracious God. See, you think it's your goodness that gets you in His presence. We think sometimes it's our good works. No, it's what Jesus has done and He's given us an invitation to come boldly into the room, into the throne room of God, to come boldly and experience His grace, to come boldly and ask Him things that seem crazy to you in your finite mind, to come boldly in the room of grace. See, I... I appreciate the other eight disciples or nine disciples. But I wanna be like James, John and Peter that get invited into the room of miracles. 
I want to be like Moses that gets in the tent of meeting and Joshua is looking there and say, wow, this is amazing, God's speaking. I want to be like the 120 that experienced the fire of God that changed the world. I, I, I want to be like every believer who says, I want to get in the room of His grace. I'm going to come boldly. Why? Because I'm righteous and holy in my own strength? No, because I have a high priest who made an ultimate price and he paid an ultimate price for me and he gives me access to the throne room of grace. And so I come into this throne room of grace and I say, my family needs a breakthrough. My, my finance needs a breakthrough. My city needs a breakthrough. I'm gonna get in the room. See, the room is available to everybody, but not everybody comes. In the room, in the room. If I was one of the nine, I would say to Jesus, why, why didn't you invite me in the room? But you don't ever hear them ask that question. You know, James and John, when they, they were talking about who would sit at the right hand of the Father and the, they were fighting for it, and Jesus says, well, who wants to be the greatest must be the, the, the least, and who wants to be the least must be, will become the greatest. They, they had this ambition to get close to Jesus. They might have processed it wrong, but there's something in them. You don't see the other nine going, or the other eight. So I wanna be there. Is there something in you that, see, I've discovered great men and women of God are, are people who don't settle, settle for earthly rooms, natural rooms, situational rooms, depression rooms, hopeless rooms, lack rooms. They say, no, no, I, I, I can access the throne room of grace. And I can walk in boldly. You know, when my kids were younger, we'd be having important meetings. And my kids would just walk into the room. Why? Because they knew they were my kids. That they had access to dad's rooms. There are other kids who weren't my kids. They, they, they would have to knock and, uh, can we get it? My kids would just walk in. We had to teach them some manners. But the truth is they could walk in because they're my kids. They didn't walk in, oh, I'm nobody, I'm useless, I'm hopeless. No, no, your dad, you're so amazing and I'm such a worm. No, they, they came in boldly because they had a realisation of love, supernatural love flowing from my Father. That's who you are. So I'm finished. Now God's turn. <laughs> He's always he was speaking through the Word. But now it's His turn to meet with His kids. We've been meeting with Him so far. This morning I just got smashed. And I was over there and, I, and the Lord spoke to me and He says, lie on your face. So I knelt. And He said, I didn't ask you to kneel. I said, to lie on your face. So when Sammy's saying, who's got, put a hand up if this, and so I'm on the, my face going like this. And I'm thinking, what do the staff in this place think right now? And then He said, lift up that. So I'm like this. I'm, it's good stretching for your core. And I'm there and I'm crying a little bit and it was good. I feel really good. But that was a preparation for what was about to happen when I came on stage when Pastor Sammy prayed for me. You have no idea what happened in that moment. You have no idea the giants that I have to face at times. And in that moment, but what was the setup for that moment was my obedience. We're gonna get in the room of the tent of meeting where His glory comes. We're gonna get in the room of the upper room. We're gonna get in the room of miracles. We're gonna get in the room of bold faith. So we're gonna do love, supernatural love, flowing from your heart. So what do you need to do? 
How do you need a posture? How do you need a position? Open those ropes. Some of you might just want to come forward. I don't know. Some of you want to, might want to find a spot, whatever. Some of you might want to kneel. Let's go. Get in the room. Show us your glory. into the room. He says, come into the room. Come into the room. Come into the throne room of grace. Come into the upper room of revival. It's kind. But it's strong. Just receive from him in his room. Just receive. Just ask him what you need right now. If you need power, say, God, I need your power. If you need a healing, say, God, I need your healing. Daddy, Daddy, have a father. Jesus, 
Let your glory fill this place. I break every stronghold of the enemy. I break every lie of the enemy and I loose the favor of Abba Father. I loose the goodness of God. I loose the joy of the Spirit. I loose visions and dreams. I loose the power of heaven. Wow, what an anointed message from Pastor Russell Evans. I know you're feeling the presence of God right there where you are, and the Lord is stirring your heart right now. You know, we have prayer partners standing by ready to pray with you. And I know that message blessed you. So, but if you need prayer today, that number's on the screen, or you can go to daystar.com and click on prayer to send us your prayer request that way. But that's why we exist. We want to encourage you. We want to pray with you. So be sure and call that number if you need prayer today. Okay, I believe beautiful Rachel Michelle is standing by, Rach. Awesome. It was powerful. If you missed any part of today's message, or you want to share it with a loved one, it's available online at daystar.com forward slash on demand. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Good luck, guys.